Um, so I'm going to also thank you very much for Toshiba for inviting me. Basically, I'm going to talk about the clinical side of things. Now, I'm a radiologist, so the technical side of it, I kind of don't understand. What I do understand is that anything that gives us uh, a more efficient, more dose efficiency is a, I was going to say it's a free lunch, but actually, as you haven't got a free lunch, maybe that's not so good. But uh, I will, I'm going to talk about our experiences over the last um, you know, year or so. So Bournemouth Hospital, no one knows where Bournemouth is. It's basically a, uh, on the south coast of the UK. It's a big general hospital, 900 beds. Um, it's also, as well as being a general hospital, it's also the regional cardiac, vascular, interventional, um, radiology and um, urology centre. So we've got 16 staff radiologists and we scan everything apart from paediatrics. So everything apart from children. So we got the original Aquilium one uh, in two th between 2009 to 2013, we had the first one in the UK, and it was, it was great. Oh, it was a single beat scanner, it was single rotation, and when we were doing cardiac studies, 16 centimeter detector, 0.35 second rotation, um, Ada 3D, we had on it iterative recon, so we had lots of radiation dose savings with that when that came, and that was good. And it was very robust for the cardiac studies we did. Our success rate was 97%. So we, if we could see pretty much all of the segments in 97% of the patients in an unselected population. So that was good. Then we got the Quillian One Next Generation was installed in November 2013. So when it was installed, it was larger bore. So that was good. We could fit larger patients in. Had a 0.275 rotation, a 900 MA tube option. That was when we first got it delivered. It was actually the, the, more the standard MA and the standard 0.35 rotation. But it had a little secret as well, which was the Pure Vision detector inside it. And that made a very that has made a very big difference, which I'm going to tell you about. So I'm going to talk about how the Pure Vision detector has really revolutionized the performance that we have from the equivalent one, which is already pretty good. And we're going to talk about the impact this improved performance has had on our department and more importantly on our patients, because that's what matters. You know, it's not the point, the point of a fancy scanner isn't so I can show fancy images to show off to my friends. It's so that the patient gets less radiation and gets a better experience and we can make better diagnoses. So just to step back a bit, the, the perfect CT scanner is it's got to be safe. It's got to produce great images using very low doses of radiation and very low doses of IV contrast. It's got to be robust. It's got to kind of work all the time on all patients producing no artifacts and no failed studies. And it's got to be easy. It's got to be easy for the radiographers. They've got to be able to scan patients easily so that we can scan patients with high throughput and you can use efficient use of resources because it's true in the whole world. We're all trying to do more with less. So how close does the Aquilian one with the Pure Vision detector get to this, basically in our experience? So just for a start, what I, when I talk about dose reduction, what do I mean by dose reduction? I mean redu reduction in two types of doses. I mean reduction in radiation dose and reduction in contrast dose. And you'll get, if you go to the, one of the lectures I urge you to go to on Wednesday afternoon, uh, Stephen Harden and Ellie Castellano will be presenting some data on uh, a BSCI dose survey, British Society of Cardiac Imaging Dose Survey. And uh, Stephen Harden, this is a paper he wrote, uh, who's current president of the BSCI, who's basically said, Should, shouldn't we just be transparent about our doses in cardiac radiology? Uh, shouldn't we publish them? So, it, and it, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of a trend in the UK that maybe that will be used as part of a marker of quality in the future. So we should get, aim to get low radiation doses if we can. So the combination of the Pure Vision detector and the Ada 3D system that was there already has, is pushing our radiation doses down to very, very low levels. And I'm going to show you some images now. This is someone, I did, I'm deliberately not showing you anorexic patients here. This is someone BMI of 29. So these are, this is overweight. I think my, my BMI is about 28, so I'm also overweight. This is someone with a critical LAD stenosis, and it's 0 0.6 millisieverts. Um, nice image quality and a very, very reasonable radiation dose. And this is different patient. We've got CT versus an invasive cardiac cath. Image on the left, one millisievert, shows a steno complex stenosis with calcification, proximal LAD. The cath, I would argue, does not show you a better image. It just shows you a the image at six times the radiation dose. So, 
CT is now getting to the point where it's probably the, the gold standard actually in assessing the lumen in many patients, and we can do it at very, very low doses of radiation. The, the reason for showing you this actually is this was actually before intervention. Because CT is now so low dose and so widely used in our institution, diagnostic catheterization for many of these patients is really historic. They, they, they already know what they're going to find, the interventionists, because we've done the CT first. So it just shows triple phase abdomen, which traditionally is a high dose study. So we've got a nice, this is all done using low noise. So pre contrast, arterial phase, and portal abdomen. And the whole thing is only 4.5 millisieverts for all of it, DLP of 265, and very, very good image quality with very, very few artifacts. We couldn't have achieved that before. So can we go really, really low for radiation with this technology? Well, with our detector and the A3D, we can go very, very low when the structures we're visualizing have high inherent contrast, such as the lungs. So this is a patient, age 35, IV drug abuser. Um, she's got a needle in her left main bronchus. And the, the reason it got there is, that, and I'm Jack, glad you haven't got your lunch at the moment. Basically, she doesn't have any intravenous access anymore, so she injects into the veins in her tongue. And the end of the needle came off when she was injecting, and she inhaled it, and it went down the left main bronchus. And um, the clinician said, shall we do a lateral? Because they thought it was there on the AP. So I said, well, why don't we do a CT? And the CT, we did at ultra low dose, and the DLP is six, which is 0.1 millisievert. So that's the same dose as the lateral x-ray would have been. And it was enough information to, for her to proceed to a rigid bronchoscopy and have that removed. And it, very nice image quality. This is a, that was a very low dose study. This is a typical study for us now, an HRCT study of the chest in a fairly kind of average weight patient. 0.5 millimeter slices, helical HRCT, and the total DLP here is 46, which is a sub millisievert. It's 0.8 millisievert. And very excellent image quality. You can see the emphysema. You can see also the lung tumor that we picked up at the same time. Something I'll talk about a little bit later is we can also do this very clever technique where we can do lung subtraction, where we can get ID maps. This is developed by Dr. Prokop, who's going to talk to you later. Basically, we do a pre and post contrast. We subtract the difference, and it gives an ID map. And we can do it at extremely low radiation dose now. The, to the total examination there is a DLP of 23, which is 0.4 millisieverts. And you can go really, really low for the sinuses. So this is. X-ray of the sinuses, this is uh, 0.02 millisieverts. So that's about one quarter of the dose of a plain film of the sinuses. So we're now less than plain film for some studies. And I think much more information. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't see, maybe it's because I'm a cardiac radiologist, but I can't see anything on X-rays of the sinuses at all. And you can actually see something on there. So I've shown you some nice pictures. Am I just showing you my best cases? Because that's what people tend to do, isn't it? So have I got any? external data, looking at our doses. Um, now, you'll hear much more about doses in general at the, at the uh, session tomorrow, but I'm just going to focus on our doses here. There was a uh, CT radiation dose audit in cardiac CT performed by the British Society of Cardiac Imaging. It, it was done twice. There was a preliminary study that was done in August 2013, and we submitted data from our original Quillian 1. Then it was done again in May 2014, and we submitted data from our next generation of Quillian 1, which has the new detector in it. So we included all of our studies. We, didn't, you know, we weren't just allowed to send the best ones. We, we didn't exclude for anything, because we don't have any, pretty much any exclusion criteria for cardiac CT, unless they can't lie on the table for some reason. So we, have, we don't exclude AF, obesity, high heart rates, or anything. And we, look, we looked at our data, and there was no difference between the two groups in terms of BMI, acquisition, heart rate, rotation speed, which was 0.35 at that time. Image noise, we set the same, so we set the same image quality. Contrast protocols were identical. So everything was identical compared with those two groups that we uh, submitted the data for, apart from the detector. That was the only difference between the two groups. And this is the result, which I think is rather surprising, given that we actually got a 44% reduction in, in uh, radiation dose. So our DLP dropped from 140, uh, 140 to 77.5, and our dose now for for all comers is these 1.08 millisieverts, so just over one millisievert for all comers, which we were surprised about. And actually, you know, the, the data actual crunching was done by someone else, so we couldn't actually fix the results. So actually, more than 40% reduction in radiation dose. 
So how do we compare with the other UK centres? Well, we did pretty well. We're right down, as you can see, we're right down the bottom there. We're number 10. So basically, in all of these centres that submitted, we did very well, and we're not selecting any of our patients. So that's just all comers, AF, everything, high heart rates. So we were happy with that. So I would I think it's pretty reasonable that we certainly want to deliver some of the lowest radiation doses you can get on any scanner in the real world with a completely unselected population. I mean, I think now we're down to a millisievert for cardiac CT. I really am not worried about the radiation dose anymore. I think there, is, you know, there are other things now to worry about. So is the problem solved? Well, I don't have to worry about the radiation anymore, but I think low radiation is only half the only um, half the story. Because contrast is the other bit of dose that we've got to worry about. So because at the moment, and I think for the foreseeable future, all current IV contrast is iodine based. And all agents can cause contrast induced nephropathy. And despite what you may or may not be told, there are no safe agents. The only way to reduce the risk of contrast in induced nephropathy, assuming that you prehydrate your patients properly, is to reduce the volume of contrast that you give, to reduce the amount of iodine that you give. So I've just got to digress into a little bit of physics, and I'm not a physicist, as you'll probably discover in a minute. I've, this, I've got to show you this graph first. It's basically showing the effect of the tube killer voltage on vessel enhancement. So basically, if you take a fixed amount of iodine, and you reduce the tube voltage, you get more enhancement. So if, if we take an iodine concentration there of five, we basically, the, the enhancement keeps going up as we go from 120, which is conventional, to 100, to 80. It keeps going up. So why is that? It's because at 80 kVp, there's lots and so we go, if we go low kilovoltage voltage now, there's lots and lots of 30 to 50 kilo keV photons which are very, very strongly absorbed by iodine. That's part of the K-edge effect, which you know, you'll probably remember with horror from your physics days. And this effect is still strong at 100 kVp, but it becomes weaker at 120. So if you can get down to low tube voltages, you get lots of low energy photons, which are blocked very strongly by the iodine, absorbed very strongly, and you get very intense enhancement. So what you can do with that is you can actually reduce your contrast volume but still maintain your enhancement if you reduce your tube voltage. So this is just a clinical example. This is not the same patient. This is three different patients. But at 120 kVp, we've given 80 mils of contrast at 5 mils a second. This is Niapam 370, but it, this trick works for anything. Hounsfield units are 587. If we go down all the way down to 80 kVp, 40 mils of contrast at 3 mils a second now, so half the amount of contrast, and we're actually getting slightly more intense enhancement. We've got Hounsfield units of 601. So basically, the image quality is constant here. The noise in the image is constant here, but we've managed to trade off contrast. Now, people will often say that reducing KVP is all about reducing dose. Well, it's, it, in my book, mostly it's actually about reducing contrast dose, not radiation dose. And you can use that in that way as well, but this is the, one of the most powerful things you can do. You can get down to very low doses of contrast. So, so what? Well, that means that using 80 kVp, you can achieve the same enhancement as you can at 100 or 120 kVp, but with much, much less IV contrast and much lower flow rates, which is important as well. So if you've got patients with renal impairment, you can now start to scan them much more safely if you're given only 40 mils of contrast. And also, more importantly to us, and I don't know what it's like in your center, but patient, patients from our wards often come down with a kind of blue cannula in their finger and we can actually scan those patients using low KVP because we need very low flow rates. Whereas if we needed higher flow rates when we used to flow, scan at 120, we needed a great big green cannula. So that sounds great, doesn't it? So why is low KVP scanning? People talk about it, but not many people actually do it very much. And it's, with some scanners, it's, it, you know, people, they say, oh, it's great. And then when you actually go to see people scan, they're not actually doing it. And the question is why? It's because there is a there is a issue here. When you reduce the tube killer voltage, you accelerate the electrons less strongly. They don't accelerate as much. So you produce not only are the photons you produce of lower energy, but there's less of them as well. So you've got less photons to work with if you drop the KVP. So one approach to that to compensate is you just use a massive x-ray tube, which just generates more photons because it just hits it much harder. But that's not very subtle. It's a bit kind of like using a bigger hammer. 
And the, the other approach is you've got less photons, but you have a more sensitive detector, so you can, make, you, you can make more use of the very small number of photons that are coming across. So you can actually live with the fact that there's less photo, photons. And this, our new detector certainly has done that. And it's opened up ATKVP scanning for us. So you do, for really routine scanning, you do need a very efficient detector. And I think you know, that's, you know, unless you've got a massive tube and you want to give loads of skin dose, I think that's what you want. You also need a very sophisticated reconstruction system because otherwise you get a lot of artifacts. And you'll need a moderately powerful tube that cools quickly as well. because You don't want to heat the tube up so much you have to wait 15 minutes for the next patient. So I'll just show you some routine clinical cases where we've managed to use low iodine. Which, which is something that we try to do routinely now. So this is 80 kVP scan. This is only 30 mils in IPAM 370 at three mils a second. And we're still getting very good PA enhancement, 547 Hounsfield units. Of course, this patient has, has not actually got a pulmonary embolus, as none of the CTPA studies do. They've got heart failure, you know, which is well, maybe, maybe it's just us, but we, no one seems to have a pulmonary embolus if they actually suspect it, but there we go. And at low KVP saves contrast dose in the abdomen as well. So iodine is iodine. So iodine in the liver in the portal phase is just the same as iodine in the vessels in the arterial phase. It's still iodine. And the trick, it, it still works. So basically, same patient scanned twice, 100 mils of NIPAM 370 on the left, 120 KVP, which is, used to be our conventional protocol. And on the right, we've managed to get down to 60 mils of NIPAM 370 a lower flow rate as well, and we've still got the same Hounsfield units. It happens to be exactly 108 Hounsfield units for both, so but adequate enhancement on both, but with a 40% less contrast because we've dropped the tube current. So we've kept the, the and actually the, because the technology's moved on, we've actually dropped the radiation dose as well, but I haven't included that there. So we, initially we had the Aquilium 1 in its 0.35 se second rotation, and now it's been upgraded recently to a 0.275 rotation. So which has given us a few other options as well that we can do. And I'm going to show you some clinical cases of that. So as a 90-year-old man, severe dyspnea and orthopnea. Now, 90 year, years old might sound quite old to you, but where I come from, it's not that old. Because in East Bournemouth, which is um, one area of, it's, it, it, it encompasses quite a lot of nursing homes. The average age of a woman of voting age, and that excludes children, is 86. So and it's one of the oldest population. It's the oldest population in the world, I think, apart from Japan. So it's, we have some old patients. So 90 is middle-aged in Bournemouth. So severe, severe dyspnea and orthopnea, can we scan the patient base? You can see it's not going well. They're at 45 degrees here, so this is not going well. We wouldn't, probably in the old days, we would have just got them off the table because conventional helical, they're not going to be able to hold the breath. It isn't going to work. So what we do now is we use the 16 centimetre detector and we just let the patient free breathe. And the scanner just goes around once, and it fires once, and uh, we get a very good image, pretty much all of the time, of the pulmonary arteries. And then the really nice thing about that is because we can see the contrast coming in, and then we fire, we can get away with very, very low amounts of contrast. So we can use only 30 mils of contrast at two and a half mils a second. And we have to use 80 kVP to do that trick, but it's, you get a great result, and you get this patient's got a great big embolus in their right uh, pulmonary artery. This just shows what, basically we do a whole rotation, single rotation, takes 0.275 seconds to go round, and that's a whole rotation, so it's still a bit blurred. This is a 96, this is slightly older, this, this patient, 96, and you can see that's a whole rotation. If we go to half segment reconstruction, so we just use half of it, now suddenly the lungs sharpen up because our temporal resolution is now 135 milliseconds. So basically, however much they're breathing, it seems to kind of always work this. And basically, if you just adjust the contrast protocol just a little bit, and this is, you can get a triple rule out study. So you can get the coronaries on pretty much everyone if you want. Now, of course, that provides issues as who's going to look at the coronaries and all the rest, but it's dead easy to do. So you just get the whole chest, you get a pulmonary arteriogram, you can look at the aorta, and you can look at the coronaries as well. And that's also a very low contrast dose as well. It's the same contrast dose. This is obese patient, so not, not a thin patient at all, 38 weeks pregnant. Basically, what do we do? Uh, in the old days, we would have sent her for a Q scan, but actually we could do it at a much lower radiation dose, a much lower contrast dose, using just a single volume acquisition. So we just get her to free breathe, three mils a second. This is actually, uh, for some reason, I'm not sure why, but we gave her 40 mils in this case, maybe because we absolutely wanted to be sure, but actually we're more confident these days, so we would just use 30. Um, and it's 0.7 millisieverts, so, and it's very low doses of contrast. And the dose to her fetus is pretty much zero. So this is a patient, BMI 35, 
free breathing. And uh, to be honest, the reason this patient was free breathing is because they spoke absolutely no English at all, and we didn't have any um, we, we didn't have any point of communication, so we just managed, just told them to kind of free breathe. Did a single rotation, and it still works actually, as long as they gently breathe. The coronary angiograms are fine because the, the temporal resolution's so good that it just freezes the motion, and it's only two millisieverts, and they've got completely normal CT. And also with that kind of rotation speed, even very high heart rates are now much, much less of an issue than they used to be. This is someone with BMI 26 who's got severe dyspnea, single beat, 30 to 90% pulse. So we just widened the radiation pulse a bit for cardiac. So we've got an end systolic reconstruction as well as an end diastolic reconstruction. So heart rate's 105 when it acquired. It's still only 1.7 millisieverts. And you get a very nice coronary angiogram and also you get functional images too. And which also, of course, tells us why this patient was breathless. It's a little disappointing that we didn't know this before we did the scan, but the ejection fraction was 7%. I mean, I'm not quite sure what happened with echo. Maybe the echo machine was broken that day, but anyway, 7%. So some with atrial fibrillation, which isn't a problem anymore for us. We just do one wide radiation pulse, one heartbeat, and it's acquired at 81 beats a minute. It's still fine. We do a single beat, end systolic reconstruction, and we've got a very nice image of the right coronary artery there. So high heart rates and AF are no problems anymore for, in the vast majority. So is it, with, with the equivalent one now, you would, can end up scanning patients you wouldn't even consent, consider scanning on a conventional scanner. So you, you can, you've got very few excuses left anymore. This is IV drug abuser. We seem to do a lot of IV dr drug abusers because there's a drug rehabilitation centre in uh, Bournemouth where people, drug addicts, uh, sell drugs to each other, basically. So, um, yeah, so I don't think there's much rehabilitation going on, but there's a lot of dealing going on. But this is someone with no IV access in their arms. Uh, they've got a foot injection, blue cannula foot injection, 80 kVp, and we can get away with that very, very low flow rate because it's 80 kVp, and we've got a, a lovely image of the thoracic aorta. Again, this is one of, our, one of the ID maps. It's basically pre and post contrast. Someone who's really, really breathless, can't hold their breath very well, and this ID lung short subtraction just works. It still works. Um, and the total radiation dose is very good at only three millisieverts. This is our largest patient. I'm interested to know whether anyone can beat this. This is the fattest patient we have ever scanned, BMI of 74. Um, she was pretty big. She, only, she touched the scanner the entire way around, and we've got a 78 centimetre bore, so that's quite impressive. She was only 34 years old, and she was having this scan done because they, she, was, she had lots of risk factors. She was a smoker, diabetic, as you would expect, a bad family history, and she was having bariatric surgery, age 34, um, for her morbid obesity. And there is no other way they could have looked at her coronary arteries. So we did a, we were asked to do a cardiac CT scan. So I, my eyes glazed over, and I said, "Well, this isn't going to work, but we'll try it." Um, and surprisingly, it did work. Um, so basically, one heartbeat. Now, they're not as beautiful as the images I showed you just now, but they are good enough to know that she's got normal coronaries at a dose of sub-5 millisieverts, which for someone who's that large is pretty impressive, and we can only do that because we've got such an efficient, efficient detector now. So the, the, that re the really good detector efficiency we've now got has led to really dramatic reductions in IV contrast across the board. And this is our standard CTPA protocol now. We basically just use 80 kVp, we use 45 mils and IPAM 370. It's a helical scan. It works in pretty much everyone, even up to fairly high BMIs of kind of in the mid 30s. And uh, that's a 40% dose reduction compared with what we used to do. We used to give 75 mils. So it's a typical CTPA that we get just over a millisievert, 45 mils of contrast at three mils a second. And you can see the right sided pulmonary emboli. And this trick works in the body as well, because we've been fairly conservative. But basically, if you look at our body protocols, this is for all our cancer scanning, we've basically, we used to give, for a, say a 70 kilo person, we used to give 80 mils of contrast, we now give 60 mils of contrast. So we drop in from 120 kVp to 80 kVp. So that's a 25% dose reduction, contrast dose reduction. Actually, that gives us better enhancement than before, because people like the enhancement. And this is a case I saw last week, and this is really brought home to me what kind of dose reductions we've achieved over the last few years, because it, it, all of them have been incremental. This is the same patient scanned twice, 2006, Aquilian 16, two millimeter slice thickness, no iterative reconstruction, total DLP 226, which is 3.8 millisieverts, which is pretty good. Same patient scanned two weeks ago, total DLP six, 
So we've gone 38 times down in dose reduction. And that actually, the image quality is a little bit more noisy on the right, but not much. And for a 38 times dose reduction, that is truly extraordinary. And it, you just wonder why we are still doing plain films, but that's another story. So in conclusion, the pure vision detector allows Equilion 1 to deliver the best image quality and the lowest dose of radiation at the moment. And it's pretty much unmatched at the moment. And the radiation doses for our cardiac CT have reduced by 40% in the real world compared with our original Aquilian one. And basically, we can do angiography in patients with renal failure using tiny doses of contrast as low as 30 mils, which is a 40% contrast dose reduction. And for routine body applications, we can use ATKVP scanning routinely, saving 25% of contrast doses compared with 120 kvp, which is what we used to before. Now, it's not the most important thing, I guess, but it does matter that the department now spends about 15,000 pounds less per year on IV contrast because of that, which is you know, not nothing. And uh, basically, CT scanning is now quick, robust, and safe in pretty much mo all patients, regardless of renal function. So we've ticked off a lot of those boxes, I think. And it's certainly been a big uh, improvement to us. And I thank you very much for your time. I would uh, welcome any questions.